Hello everyone, today we talk about the fall of the Longobard Kingdom. Um, as you know, I have already made a series of video about Longobard history, uh, which is a topic I, uh, I particularly like uh, for reasons that I mention really all the time in the same videos. That is essentially the, um, the relative, um, you know, uh, ignorance that exists um, still today um, about Langebert history in popular culture, um, which strongly contrasts with the, the actual importance that it had in the uh, Latin Germanic world of that time as a Romano-Germanic kingdom, and all the uh, very strong influences that it had, uh, not just uh, in Italy, but especially after the, con the, the Frankish conquest of the Italian peninsula throughout all, uh, all over Europe. Uh, the Langebert kingdom also suffers of all these stereotypes, you know, related to the barbarians. Uh, the, the idea that the Langebirds were these ruthless and most barbaric people of all because they, they came from uh, uh, non-Romanized areas of Europe, like the Goths, um, uh, for instance, and that kind of destroyed everything. And um, unfortunately, this is uh, a completely uh, um, um, a myth, completely devoid of any historical grounding. Uh, the fact that the Longobards weren't um, were not, or at least were uh, um, very superficially Romanized, uh, didn't absolutely mean that they caused damage to uh, the Italic society, and that especially. Um, they, 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 they weren't capable of doing anything uh, civilly uh, advanced in the future because um, indeed Langobard Kingdom, and this is true history, you know, go read um, historiography about Langobards, the real one, the, the modern um, up to up updated one, um, was um, extremely advanced, civically, spe civilly speaking, um, and the Longbirds surely had a, m a much stronger sense of the public authority and knew how to make it work compared, for instance, to, to the, uh, the Franks. Which doesn't mean, you know, the Franks were advanced in other ways. And in fact, I will be talking today about a chapter that is the end of the Longbird Kingdom um, by hand of the uh, Carolingians. And um, the... Um, Sorry, there was a bit of a, a an interruption, <laughs> but uh, I I start uh, I don't start again. I simply continue, and um, and um, for the simple fact that in fact the Longobard Kingdom was invaded by the the Franks at a point, um, at this point of the at the end of the eighth century, and um, and in a very different situation that that you know the usual because um, the Carolingian the creation of the Carolingian Empire was um, something really unique in history. I mean, uh, thi things could really take another path. The Carolingians were quite lucky that basically um, from um, um, Charlemagne to Ludwig the Pius, for many uh, vicissitudes, the, the, um, these two sovereigns um, uh, survived all their siblings, so there wasn't a splitting of the empire, and there was a certain continuity in Carolingian rule, Carolingian monarchy that um, was extremely um, 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 you know, influent on uh, on Langobard matters, and uh, as we will be seeing. But you know, without getting too much in, into uh, abstraction, let's um, talk about um, how the Langobard Kingdom actually ended, and let's overall draw an outline what 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 it basically happened and why it happened, because there is also a lot of debate and prejudices and stereotypes about that, like the idea that the Longobards were weak or kind of divided or that had not achieved, you know, that their kingdom was mm, falling apart. This is all uh, a pretty stupid um, belief, telling the truth, for, for the people who study history. Today we can't really um, make an extremely um, you know, detailed um, history of the fall of the Longobard Kingdom in the sense that theoretically I could do that because <laughs> I wrote uh, a very long 
work on on it um, and um, I could go in much deeper detail but that's something I, I, I plan to do if, if I'll have the time in the future and by really telling Longobard history in, in in greater detail than what I'm doing. Now I'm just doing kind of general videos and and this implies that I'm not uh, entering into what most people would find like as minutia essentially um, and I, I don't want to bore people, but mm, sh mm, surely I will be talking in detail about Longobard history, and and especially the military one because that's the um, specific field in which I I once um, researched. And by the way, with some of the most mm, of, of the best scholars of Longobard history. Um, um, existing in a world and <laughs> I, I don't mean I have you know all this knowledge and eventually I go I don't want to boast that as if I knew longer about history better than other people but it's at the same time extremely embarrassing I, the the complete uh, unawareness of the truth of Longobard history uh, aside from general cliches and uh, other very silly and superficial um, opinions that you can hear about them. Like most of history indeed, probably I say very stupid things when talking about topics in general that evenly I, I, I'm, no, I'm not an expert on because I haven't researched uh, properly on them and I just talk out of what I know and giving maybe foot for toe rather than actual deep uh, detailed information. So um, regarding to the fall of the Longobar Kingdom we could start from very long um, uh, from a from from a l very long time before the one I said I chose to choo to, to to talk about today. Um, today I will essentially start talking from um, about Langobard history and it at the end of the kingdom uh, since the death of the Langobard king Lutbrand. Now Lutbrand was this um, amazing figure, he was actually the, the greater of the Langobard kings, at least he's remembered uh, for this, um, if anything because he ruled the, uh, the Langobard kingdom at the um, peak of its uh, power. Um, but also because he was an extremely skilled um, politician, a brilliant administrator, he was, uh, um, you know, he is famous also because he, and we can know the, the characteristics of the Longobard kings, w um, since he, he wrote, um, he emanated many new laws. Uh, Rothery had made this first, uh, first edict in the 40s of the 7th century, then eventually uh, certain kings, including Lutbrand, basically added um, uh, new new laws in in uh, new um, norms uh, in, into the Langobard law, um, and um, and fr from these norms uh, of Lutbrand, you can really understand the the, the deep intelligence of this man. Um, and I will surely talk about him even in detail. Now we start since he, he died. But let's say that Lutprand had, um, and this has necessarily to be to be said, um, greatly expanded the um, even the the power of the Langobard Kingdom over uh, areas of of central Italy um, that were fractioned between uh, papal Rome. Um, the rem remnants of the um, of the Byzantine territories, uh, chiefly the Exarchate of Ravenna, which is te technically it's in the north, but kind of uh, it's kind of attached to you know the, the, this corridor that connected um, Ravenna with Rome, and especially uh, the Duchy of the Langobard Duchy of Spoleto, that was this um, relatively detached um, entity that formerly belonged to to the uh, Langobard kingdom but was very autonomous and often um, rebelled to um, to Pavia. Um, so um, the the expansion of Lutbrand had um, gone at expenses especially of Rome. Rome was a very big city for those times, standards in Western Europe um, and it was chiefly or at the time recognized a very high moral um, a, a very highly um, um, a very important um, 
spiritual guide of the West. Uh, at this time there is not um, uh, the idea of the primacy of Rome that is expressed during the Gregorian Reformation, but we can say that the Latin Germanic uh, West from uh, from Spain to England and France and the same long about Italy still felt um, Rome to be kind of the first spiritual reference um, um, in, in the Christian in, in Christian West and they attributed to the Roman Pope a great um, uh, moral authority and prestige. So the Longobards had always had uh, this problem of mm, having conquered basically um, half of Italy in a, in a very uncoordinated way and, and, and Rome was um, a big power that stood in the middle. I, I'm saying great power in the sense that at this point Western Europe is so weak economically speaking that uh, even the same walls of Rome that um, were uh, restructured by the popes uh, exactly because of the Longobard threat um, at this time were a formidable obstacle for for an, uh, any uh, any army of that time, so the the, the problem uh, was increased by the fact that um, the Longobards uh, converted uh, by the mid of the seventh century had already converted to Catholicism. So the the play with Rome was quite ambiguous because from one side the Longobards would to be allied with Rome against the Exarchate of Ravenna because also the popes didn't uh, like Byzantine influence more than much even though they were technically still part of the Roman Empire uh, as them um, and uh, at the same time they wanted to to um, to occupy Rome and to not to wipe uh, to wipe out the papacy, which would have been ridiculous and completely historically senseless, but on the contrary, to um, exercise a Longobard protection over the papacy and through um, uh, a philo Longobard papal policy, strengthening the um, uh, the destinies of their uh, kingdom. Um, but this could um, um, happen also through war and very, um, you know, by a very, um, you know, um, big uh, military force to to conquer Rome. And uh, Lutprand had even put uh, Rome under siege at this time, uh, and this is the, f the the first moment in which the um, the um, the the popes, um, the pope of, of that time. Uh, asked um, for help to the Franks. Uh, has and, and this is um, because it had happened many times before the, the call of Charlemagne that eventually even came basically by itself uh, largely because of how things had turned uh, like um, at this age. But this idea of, of the Roman Pope calling for Frankish help was something that you can find uh, in the uh, in, in the early 8th century and telling the truth even before because there were contacts uh, between uh, the um, even the Merovingians and and, and, and and the popes at a point um, not really an anti longobard function uh, function but um, generally speaking oriented to you know um, f from the papal side to to taste the ground in many ways and to um, to test the ground, <laughs> not to taste the ground, <laughs> to see if this um, big Frankish, relatively big Frankish power, because that had also a quite of up and downs during 7th century history especially, um, could be capable of intervening in favor of the Pope um, in many ways. So that tells you, mm, incidentally, among the other things, how important was still international politics even in the so-called dark ages. Uh, there was actually a lot of diplomatical activity. Um, it was a, a lot of communication between uh, the various powers of Europe, but also because at that time these powers uh, from a political, um, from a geographical point of view, were much less fragmented than they would come to be in the low Middle Ages. You have the, the, these big blocks in Italy, the Longobards, in Central Europe, this big thing of the Franks, then the, then the English in, in, in Britain and uh, the Visigoths before, before they were wiped out in, by the Arabs in Spain. So th in communication with Mm, such a few uh, heads, uh, leading heads, was easier. Mm. 
um, and and uh, it, it could make politics uh, also re relatively simple. So it would be kind of natural for the Pope to interact with the Franks. Um, and um, uh, at, at, that at the time of, of Lutprand's uh, siege of Rome, in fact, the Pope had called from for help, um, and um, he um, 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 he 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 called Charles Martel, and Charles Martel, um, but at that time, first of all, had had. Um, kind of um, problems uh, in his own home because he was clashing against the Arabs and also especially had problems with um, the, the the Frankish aristocracy. Um, uh, that is also a world that we will be exploring in, in, in our videos uh, soon, I believe. Um, it, he couldn't really intervene, militarily speaking, in Italy to, to clash uh, with longer birds to protect the Pope, but it was enough uh, for for Charles Martel to just, you know, send uh, an embassy and telling, you know, Longbirds, what are you doing right now? Lutbrand, keep down, keep it down, and and Lutbrand basically gave it up. But it wasn't just much of a Frankish uh, intervention. It was mo mostly something that had to do with Lutbrand's uh, actual mm, capability of mm, um, maintaining the territories that he had uh, conquered uh, to the Pope in central Italy. Uh, this also led to the famous donation of Sutri, which eventually was uh, has been magnified by historiography as a like the beginning of territorial mm, mm, power of of of, of, papas, of at least of secular um, of the birth of the papal states, because basically Lutbrand, reckon we have this document in which Lutbrand uh, gives back uh, this sort of castrum, castle um, of Sutri back to to the, mm, the Pope, because that had already belonged to him. So historiography decided to make a big deal about it, but you know, at the time, really, it was nothing strange. You know, <laughs> it happened. All, uh, it had happened before, also many times. The fact that we don't have documentation really doesn't add anything to the whole thing. This this castrum of Suter was also a very small thing, very insignificant. But you know, mm, historiographies and perspectives. Um, the mm, so there 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 kind of had already taken place a, a kind of Frankish intervention against the Longbirds in favor of the papacy, at least diplomatically speaking. Now, with the death of Lutbrand that occurred, if I'm not wrong, in 743 or 44, it's one of the two years, uh, rose to the power um, um, a Friulan uh, king, uh, uh, Rakis, or Ratkis, I prefer Ratkis. Um, um, I stress the fact it was Friuland because um, the, f the Friuland nobility had been um, um, had had been really um, um, had had problems with Lutbrand um, initially, um, and um, for reasons that now I, I can't explain because it, uh, where it's, it it will get too long, unjustifiably. But um, it wasn't really, it, it, uh, contrary wise to most people think, this um, northeastern Langobard uh, aristocracy hadn't really anything against the kingdom of the Langobards as such. They had always remained faithful to the unity of the kingdom. Uh, they felt probably to be kind of the truest Langobards because they were the ones who had uh, kept living uh, in um, in the in the first areas in which Longobards had settled during the the first invasion, who were incidentally also less urbanized and were on a very uh, hot frontier with the Slavs and the Arabs, uh, the Avars, sorry, uh, which had kind of kept them in shape from a military point of view. Uh, similarly, what we what happened with the Carolin the the first Carolingians on the Saxon frontier, it's interesting to make uh, comparisons. Um, and and they were a, a quite proud aristocracy. And uh, Lutprand, for political reasons, had at a point punished um, uh, an act of disobedience that, however, was pretty nauseous to 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 the kingdom itself, um, but the Longobards accepted, um, um, you know, 
this kind of action uh, in in itself and they uh, because mm, both sides the king and the freelian nobility kind of behaved the right way everyone maintaining their own opinion but c and and that was something like maintaining the word even if it was against um the uh, the king's intention as as a as a, a manly virtue you know the idea that the individual has good if he has good reason to to stand um um wrongdoing that's you know that's what he has to persist in and telling the truth the free and aristocracy in that occasion was kind of right and Lutbrand had to intervene just to to keep other things in balance but what is remarkable is that during one of the campaigns of Lutbrand in central Italy against the Byzantines and the um, Reb Longobard rebels of, of Spoleto um, he mm, he was um, he had um, his army saved by the um, Friulan rear guard that in, in which the same Ratkes that was at the time that um, Duke of, of Friuli um, uh, fought very brilliantly together with his um, brother Eistolf that we'll get to know in this video as well and kind of proved their loyalty to the king and and um, and saved basically the whole Longobard army so these were um, uh, these were f um, a branch of the Longobards that that was um, very much prized and, and praised um, in, in the Langebird world, and um, and 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 by the way, the fact that um, a Freeland king had been elected is is something that um, is very important because Langebirds elected their kings. There was no dynastic continuity, and the fact that the whole Langebird kingdom elected a Freeland nobleman means actually that. And so, uh, therefore, the whole Langobard uh, aristocracy, even the one from which Lutbrand had stemmed and that still appreciated Lutbrand, decided that Ratkis uh, uh, Friuland was the right choice for the Lang for leading the Langobard kingdom at that time. Now, Ratkis, however, was a kind of um, um, Ratkis was a kind of um, um, of a, yeah, well, a f fascinating character because he he had yes this mm, warlike background like the northeasterner um, Langovards, but he he was also a, a highly spiritual man. Um, he um, initially he kept good uh, relation with papacy, the same that Lutbrand had basically restored. Um, but uh, there were certain conditions for which uh, the Longobards once again uh, reopened hostilities um, uh, against uh, Papal Rome. And at the siege of uh, Perugia in, uh, in Umbria, he was defeated actually, and um, he was um, forced to. Um, to he wasn't really forced to to abdicate, but he decided freely and autonomously to abdicate. And he was also wounded, so that was an important thing to bear in mind when, um, like um, you know, relatively to kings, kings had to be physically fit also for fighting. And and and, and back in this early medieval times, in 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 societies of Germanic tradition like the Longobard one, this thing of the um, warrior king's uh, physical integrity was was quite and fitness um, was quite felt. So Ratkis himself decided to retire into the Abbey of Monte Cassino, um, which was in the um, territories of um, you know, of the Duchy of Benevent uh, in the south. Uh, the Duchy of Benevent. Um, was kind of more faithful than one of Spoleto to the um, the Langobards of the north, um, um, and so and, and, and already at the time, Monte Cassino was a very important spiritual uh, center, um, and um, and this choice um, from Ratkis is not really uh, unusual. Also, considering that the Duchy of Benevent seemingly had um dynastic ties with uh, with um, the duchy of friuli uh which means that uh benevent and uh, friuli kind of had kind of sympathy one between the other and the fact that there was a friulian king obviously um, p um pushed benevent to come closer to to the kingdom of the north 
Um, and at this point, the the Longobards elected um, Eistulf, who was, as we've said, Ratke's brother. Uh, he had been one of the fiercest opposers of Lutbrand during the the the, um, the descent that they had had back in the day in Friuli. Uh, but he was also very. Uh, he was a very uh, a, a great warrior and 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 commander, telling the truth. Um, but he al he also was an extremely smart man. Um, Heistulf um, was a very energetic sovereign too, and he decided to keep on very steadily um, an aggressive policy towards uh, Rome um, and and the Byzantine territories in general. So um, he also, um, Heistulf, uh, we will be talking about that also in other uh, episodes, but Heistulf did something very important um, before uh, resuming war against the Byzantines that tells us um, uh, a great deal about Longobard society uh, and in the, in the myth of the 8th century. Um, basically, he, for the first time, he made the so-called Romans uh, entering into the uh, Langobard, not really into the Langobard army, but um, into military service of the kingdom. Now, the Langobards, as Germanic freemen, had um, mm, basically maintained the idea, in Italy, the idea that only um, Langobards uh, can bear arms and participate to the army and make war. The, nor the Romans technically were, were not, um, in theory, were kind of inferior from a legal point of view and couldn't do that. But the problem that also troubled historians for a long time and that today is, that is uh, solved is that um, at the time of Eistulf, Basically, the whole Italian population living within the uh, Langobard kingdom was Langobard by law, which means that all the Roman population, excluding um, a very small part, telling the truth, had simply passed into the Langobard, um, into the Langobard society. This happened with, uh, you know, certain procedures like. Um, um, the um, renownedly the, the freeing or liberation of serfs, like the Romans were originally by the hands of their Langobard masters. Uh, it was something convenient at a point, also because um, uh, early medieval Italy, just like the rest of the West, wasn't a much dynamic uh, world. So the idea of having even uh, all a mass of serfs w wasn't kind of feasible. It was not convenient. And and by the time of Eistulf, we can say that now the whole su population of, of, of the Longobard kingdom was essentially Longobard and participated to the army. But there were still um, those um, people that had been, um, that were juridically Roman because they mm, they lived in those lands that had newly conquered by the Longobards to the Byzantines. So uh, what happened is that Heistulf um, um, look at the at those guys like and especially the, the wealthiest ones that existed in, in the Byzantine lands and he said okay um, you're Roman and we accept you and Mm, and by the way, I still f even pushed something very new, ideologically speaking, into the Langobard kingdom. That was uh, that he was king not just of the Langobards, but also protector of the Romans. So in a certain sense, um, he was pushing towards the fusion of the two elements. And with the recruitment uh, laws that he inserted in, in, in the edict, in the Langobard law, um, he basically said that uh, on a sensual base, so on, on the base of how, mu uh, how you much you earned, um, also if you were a, a Roman, you had to participate to the army. Uh, this is very fascinating because actually there are, you know, the the um, the sensual ladder of um, of the. Uh, of uh, both of the Langobards and the Romans from these laws is completely um, comparable. I mean, they were equated in the same time. The only difference being that s um, 
from <laughs> from one side were the Longobards, and from one time, from the other side, the so-called Romans. Um, but the the actual amount of equipment required on a sensual base was uh, equivalent um, in both societies. Uh, this is quite important because um, it also um, expresses the need to enlarge the Longobard army, um, which seemingly was achieved, and it reflected the the, expan the same expansion of the Longobard kingdom that was evidently mm, healthy at that point in, in order to expand um, so much. And it's not just a matter of numbers, it was simply you know, the fact that and there were more territories to control, and that uh, the, the, the Longbirds were um, proportionally accelerating in their uh, in the in completing the conquest of the Italian peninsula, because that was their goal since the very beginning. The Longbirds claimed that they were um, kings of all Italy, all of Italy. That was quite meaningful, considering that half of Italy was in Byzantine hands. But it's important that since a very early age, uh, already in at the end of 6th and beginning of 7th century, the Longobards knew that um, Italy was their uh, natural mm, target uh, for expansion. Which strategically really makes sense uh, in those conditions. Then we don't know what they would have done, uh, but were uh, once they would have achieved that, but they surely were going um, to uh, to um, to to happen if uh, the Carolingian invasion uh, had not occurred. This is pretty much evident, and <laughs> it's the same reason why the popes called the Franks, because evidently the Langobard threat was um, uh, solid uh, enough. So the war with between the Langobards and, and and the Pope, let's say the Pope, but I don't want to, I, I don't want to really mean in any way that it was an ideological adversion from the Langobard side to Catholicism or to the Church of Rome. It was just that certain popes made an active secular policy that was aimed at uh, weakening the Langobard kingdom. The Langobards at this time were fully Catholic. They didn't absolutely want to take the papacy out, but on the contrary, to exploit it for their own aims, li just like the Carolingians eventually would do. Um, and um, actually, the, the military and diplomatic um, events are quite complex, and we, we don't have now time to um, to, to 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 cover them all. But uh, let's say that it was a, a, a huge pressure of the Longbirds on Rome. Uh, Isulf was also a very good leader, as uh, we were saying. So at a certain point, the Pope, that is Stephen II, decides to, to leave for, for France uh, to call the help of the, uh, of the Carolingians. Now the the nice thing about this, and that tells you really how you know the, the, there was an alternation of mm, wars and diplomatic events, etc., is that the same Longobards uh, let the Pope pass through their territories to go to France, and this tells you how also how you know dub um, ambiguous and 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 double the the mm, the both the papal and the Longobard policy actually was. Because at that point it wasn't just a matter of Langobards and, and papacy. It was also a matter of, 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 of the Carolingian power that was incredibly expanding. So actually the Longobards were quite worried also about the eventuality that the Franks would intervene into Italy uh, to help the Pope. But at the same time, it was in this sense the the mask of the good guys that weren't so you know ferocious at the point of even preventing the Pope to cross their own uh, their own territories. I mean, if the Pope wanted to communicate with the Franks, he could have done it anyway. So this was this was also a, a nice move to say, yeah, we are the Longbirds. We're doing nothing wrong in the end. You can even pass through our um, borders. Um, the point is also that Rome, um, at this time we're talking about papacy as if the popes actually governed uh, a papal state, but it wasn't really that fashion. Things are much more, uh, a bit more 
blurred at this point because um, the papacy indeed has the Pope as Bishop of Rome, as many other bishops around, even in the Carolingian Empire at this point, or in other areas of Italy, were quite of a secular power in many ways. Um, but there was still a Roman aristocracy d from which the same papacy uh, was, um, you know, the same popes were elected, that was uh, divided in, in a pro Longobard in a, to a, into an anti Longobard faction. So there was really, it was not really a matter of, of Longobards fighting against the papacy, but the Longobards fighting against the anti Longobard faction among the Roman aristocracy in many ways. So it's very fascinating to, to think that theoretically, like it happened even afterwards, the um, uh, there was an, uh, a, a very concrete and viable chance that uh, the um, pro Langobard faction would have prevailed into Rome. And at a point, it was even about to, to happen, um, but they were reversed by the opposite faction, um, so that Rome could have simply opened the gates to the Langobards to install a, pr um, um, a philo Langobard pope. Mm, and history would have taken. Um, surely another path, not because the Longobards probably could have withstood, wi wi withstood the uh, the Carolingian invasion, but because there would have been totally different relations even between the Papacy and the Carolingians, so it's something very complicated, but I it's a viable, uh, it it's a plausible scenario, telling the truth. So please never force the dichotomy on oh, the Longobards were against Catholicism because they were Arians. No, at this time they were fully Catholics. Uh, oh, so they were against the papacy. No, they weren't against the papacy. <laughs> they were just playing their own cards, like the Carolingians did eventually. Um, and um, the, uh, as I was saying, the, the Pope Stephen II went to um, to France. There was uh, uh, the famous meeting at Pontion, I believe, which is uh, I think in northeastern France, into which um, the um, Mayor Domus, so the Master of Palace, uh, Pippin, and his two um, Pippin Short and his two sons, who were Charles, um, eventually Charles uh, Charlemagne, Charles the Great, and his Caroline, and he proclaimed them um, Patrizzi of the Romans. So mm, this idea of the Patrizius, Patricius, as, as you want to, um, how do you say that uh, in English? The patrician, oh wow, yeah, so that's the uh, current word. Patricians of the Romans was um, a title which uh, at that point in political practice meant it was pretty unusual as an option, let's say, but it kind of meant protector of Rome and implicitly of papacy. And wh what is interesting about that, it's uh, the, um, the actual mm, Roman uh, legacy that was expressed through uh, the title, in the sense that the Franks weren't anew to um, an idea of a Roman of resizing Roman imperialism. The idea of being crowned eventually as Roman kings, as it happened eventually with Charles um, in 800, wasn't something new, because in d in the late antique and early medieval periods, the Franks actually were entrusted by the papacy with. Um, with certain honors. I think the same Eastern Roman emperors at the point gave the imperial insignia to, to the Franks. And since they were objectively the larger power in, in continental Europe um, since the 6th century, even though during the 7th century they kind of torn the cell themselves apart and they, they weren't much more of a power, by the end of the 7th century actually the Longobard Kingdom was more powerful even than uh, what had remained of the Merovingian um, Empire. Uh, the Franks felt that they were kind of uh, a chosen people, uh, like just like the, the Jews or the Romans, um, 
um, in the sense that they they were called by God to perf they, they were Catholics since a very early age, and that all that is also important because they immediately ha had immediately entered into the Roman into the Gallo-Roman society. It was a very highly Romanized um, um, environment and very tied to to Rome in many ways. So they they had immediately kind of put themselves into relation with a the Roman imp uh, imperial dignity, b the uh, mm, the papal um, uh, religious authority and and from this they they had already kind of always thought of themselves to be I can't say the Western emperors because that was something that it, that would be too much but that they kind of had a role in keeping things in balance in the West. And objectively, especially during the uh, Carolingian Renaissance of, of the Frankish Empire, this was evidently seeming to be true. So a Pope anointing, um, a, a Pope proclaiming um, um, Patrician of the Romans, Pippin, um, um, and, and by the way recognizing them as a rightful um, uh, Frankish monarchs, because technically speaking, they were masters of palace initially of the Merovingians. So the, uh, the Merovingians eventually died out, and uh, the uh, the Pope kind of uh, comforted the transition and the legitimation um, from the Mer of the passage of mm, royal dignity from the Merovingian to the Carolingian dynasty, and and it passed also from here. Now it's very fascinating to think um, even about Charles the Great being a, uh, a very extremely young man, kind of a kid, um, and show him seeing in his northern world this man coming from Rome and proclaiming them patricians. You know, you, it, it was probably also quite powerful from from an ideological point of view for Charles the Great. But even if it was a very big thing, um, and um, and especially uh, it implied that the Franks now had to come into arms into Italy, um, which is they did what they did in in 754, Pepin invaded Italy. Um, there is um, kind of strategical dimension to these Carolingian invasions uh, of Italy that that uh, uh, that is fascinating because obviously between France and Italy you have the Alps, which um, are still a, a kind of a strategical bulwark today. You can imagine for eight century armies. Um, and 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 from these invasions of Italy, you can you can't really understand how big and and, and ahead the the Carolingians had gone in terms of their um, military and the development of their military machine and their lo especially their logistical capabilities. Um, they had uh, basically the, the the largest amount of resources in, Euro in Europe, and they mounted up these expeditions to invade the Alps. Now the Longobards in this space were extremely small. You know, p people sometimes say, well, but why did Longbirds eventually fell to the Carolingians? Well, were they weak? Well, you can't really place the Carolingians of the second half of the 8th century with lo the Longbirds of Italy. I mean, the Longbirds had done pretty well up to that point, being a Romano-Germanic uh, kingdom. Um, they were they had a pretty solid mm, public administration that they they had managed to expand while basically the other germanic peoples had already kind of shrank think about the, the visigoths or the burgundians etc even the same franks if it had not been for the carolingians basically had imploded in two merovingian times so the longobards were already on their own quite successful but basically the core of their of their kingdom was uh, the po valley and you can't really uh, think that the, the resources that the Franks owned that stretched from the Pyrenees uh, to 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 Frisia, um, so the, with the wall, some of the major European rivers in the middle, and all the f those fertile lands of, of Gaul, etc., could really withstand um, 
uh, you know, it was kind of a match for, for the Franks to invade the Longbirds, on the contrary. But the Longbirds had been wise since the um, beginnings in the sense that they had settled their um, power into the Po Valley, which was heavily defended by the Alps. Um, uh, and when the Franks invaded, um, the Longbird strategy was basically to block the uh, the Franks at the um, uh, at the Alpine passes. Now, since the Franks had already invaded Italy uh, in Merovingian times, especially when uh, the the basically they wanted to wipe out the, the Longbirds together with the Byzantines in the second half of the sixth century. And consider that after the Greek Gothic War, the the, the bands of, of of Franks and Alaman, uh, Alamanni had actually invaded Italy and reached up to uh, Byzantine Italy and reached up to the, the south of the peninsula, raiding and pillaging. Um, the um, as a result, uh, being the Franks stronger than Longobards, the the Frankish territory actually uh, ended at the opening of the valley of the alpine uh, valleys um uh, o o uh on on the po um on the po plan so uh, the, the uh, and still today in fact it can the and this is fascinating the border between france and italy is all shifted towards the italy uh, italian side because the border is not on the watershed uh, as it mostly happens with when there are mm, countries bordering um um, tr with um, mountains, because th the French ha had always the upper hand from from the Alpine, from from the French side over uh, Italy. Um, this is, you know, like all the military strategy, all the strategists uh, kind of said that it's impossible to invade France from Italy. Unfortunately, it's it's what the Italians attempted to do during World War II, and, and obviously they 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 failed miserably. But um, to tell you that there are certain geographical dimensions that um, that kind of make the difference even at that time. Now the Longobards weren't uh, were also quite different from the the Franks in the um, in their military organization. The the, the Longobards were kind of the standard Romano-Germanic people, so they weren't kind of worse than the average. Uh, on the contrary, they they seemingly had a, a rather efficient administrative system at least for mobilization of the army etc and which means that it was basically an army made up of freemen um, who had uh, a few um, aristocratic um, elements because um, the Longbirds uh, differently from the Franks and all um, didn't have um, just like all the rest of the Germans um, um, a feudal system you know, the English didn't have a feudal, feudal system, the, the Visigoths didn't have a feudal system. The feudal system was invented by the Carolingians, and it was like the, the major thing that had ever occurred in Europe at that point from a military point of view, because um, the, the Franks were the only ones at this time that could have a professional mounted military elite. Also, the, the Longobards had a mil uh, mounted military elite, but it wasn't professional, because they didn't have enough land um, uh, per capita, like it instead happened to the, the Carolingian counts, to exercise on. Uh, Carolingian feudalism is all about war. It's all about the concept that you have to have a huge quantity of land, and which implies also a very dramatic uh, social stratification. You know, Carolingian Europe, uh, Carolingian uh, France was extremely more uh, stratified, uh, socially speaking, the Langobard Italy. Langobard Italy was the, the wealthiest um, country in the world per capita at that point, but it still meant that basically no one owned a huge quantity of land, and even the Langobard kings themselves, as personal uh, properties, had less than certain Carolingian uh, dukes, uh, as certain Carolingian counts. So the, the, the practical consequence is that while the Carolingians invested everything they had in military training, the, the rest of the peoples didn't, and it was mostly, you know, maybe they were extremely courageous, individually speaking, but they had no means in col in, in enough collective training to withstand the uh, Carolingian military machine. 
So what happened, uh, even in, in an advantageous strategic situation like, you know, uh, waiting for the Carolingian army um, uh, at the end of uh, the Alpine Valleys and blocking the valley with um, a sort of volume that is uh, a fortified uh, structure that is meant to stop the advance and to close the passage of the valley, uh, the Longobards were defeated by the Franks at this point. Um, Isulf, um, in the first um, uh, attack um, that launched against the, the Carolingian, Bangbert was also even to be killed. Isulf was fanatically courage courageous, like seemingly the Friulan uh, nobility all was, which had brought to problems in the past, because at, at a point Friulan uh, aristocracy against his labs got themselves slaughtered just to arrive first to, to a fortified posi Slavic position on the top of a hill and got all slaughtered. So you, you can be extremely courageous, but that can be also a hell of a problem in many ways. Well, Heistulf got almost himself killed at that point. Um, the, 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 the Langebert army was in, in disarray and, and disorder, and they fled, and the Franks entered into Italy. And and once the Franks entered into the Po Valley, there was really no <laughs> thing you could really do at that point if not closing yourself into one of the um, one of the long, uh, of the walled cities that dotted uh, the Po Valley, but it was basically uh, leaving all the initiative to to the enemy. But Pippin um, didn't really want to uh, conquer Italy at that point. It was just a showdown that he had to do to even getting obviously certain material results, but not occupation of land. Uh, he basically imposed peace to Heistulf, um, and um, um, he um, he basically made Heistulf at least promising to return. Uh, all the territories that had belonged to the Byzantines that the, con that the uh, Longobards had conquered to the apostolic seat of Peter, which means that all the uh, Byzantine lands that the Longobards had uh, conquered had to be given to the Pope. You can imagine, and, and th these were a huge quantity of territories, because it, um, at, at this point Heistulf had conquered uh, Ravenna, so the Exarchate had been um, wiped out by the Longbirds. So there, w there were the regions of Romagna, Emilia, uh, Marche, Lazio and Umbria that were basically the whole central, um, you know, um, corridor that, that stretched from, from the Po Valley to, to Rome. Um, and and um, now we will be seeing what eventually happened, but uh, what is of excruciating importance is that Pippin asked the Longbirds, and not just the fact that he asked the Longbirds, but what he asked, that such an amount of territory had to be given to the Pope. So that territory belonged technically to the Byzantines, who were the kind of rival empire in Europe uh, uh, of the Franks. Uh, and what Franks were saying to bring obviously the, the papacy from their side, because they obviously already saw him as, as a political pawn to be used, was that the Pope now could, could rule as a secular power over imperial lands. Now you can imagine what a what a, this is really a revolution. I'm, I'm not really a fan of uh, this term in history, but you can't really understand how it changed so much from an ideological, from a, a juridical point of view. Obviously the Byzantines, <laughs> you know, uh, they couldn't really laugh though because they they couldn't really intervene and one of the reasons St Stephen II had, uh, had gone to France and not to Constantinople for help is that the, the Byzantines couldn't intervene in Italy in favor of the papacy like they had used to do in the past. The reason being that they were uh, kind of messed up with the Arab invasions and all, so Italy was conceived at that, ta at that point like a, a sort of distant province of the empire that, that they couldn't really do much about. Um, there were still Byzantine um, strongholds in the south, but they were you know, nothing more than, than garrisons, so uh, no, you know, I it's extremely important, and think also in this sense of the consequence of the Arab invasion, that it, it that they had not occurred 
probably the papacy would have never even called the Franks uh, to crown them uh, emperors of the West, and they would have stuck with with um, with, with the Byzantines as the uh, traditional um, helpers of, of Rome. Uh, that was still technically a, a Byzantine duchy as well, because it was the Duchy of Rome as an administrative repartition. So, think of all the implications of such events. So, um, the um, the um, there was also a lot of other things because this is the, the period of iconoclasm so there was the idea that Byzantines were kind of unfit to be uh, because they were conceived as heretics the problem of iconoclasm I talked about iconoclasm if you look at by in my Byzantine history playlist there is a, a good mm, chapter about the on iconoclasm if you want to check that out just feel free to do it better so in, to make the long story short, was a lot of attrition between Rome and Constantinople, even from a doctrinal point of view at that, at that point. Um, and, and it wasn't the first time, telling the truth. Um, the and, and I must say that the Longobards, even though they were uh, adverse to Rome, they'd always man uh, were, uh, maintained themselves as faithfully Catholic. You know, they even um, kind of backed Byzantine um, doctrinal heterodoxies for, you know, going against the Pope. No, the Longobards were quite simple people. They knew what they wanted and <laughs> they kind of got that. Unfortunately, uh, they they did it at, at the bad moment. Um, and um, the mm, in a bad moment especially, not just because there was a, a big Frankish a power developing beyond the Alps, because technically at that point, um, you know, if um, uh, Carlo Magnus had not de uh, died, that is, mm, Charles Mann's brother, probably Charles the Great would have neither had the time to, to invade uh, um, Italy, so it was still technically possible that the Longobards had a shot at that point. But what was really mm, serious, I think, in perspective is that the papacy at this point was really on the rise from an ideological point of view. If you think about the the Donatio Constantine, the, the fascination of Constantine, it was eventually, you know, uh, recognized as, as a false in the 15th century, was being produced um, around these times, in the sense that the, the popes were really, first of, firstly, thinking about really getting at the top of Christianity and uh, intervening in secular affairs very, very directly. So, it's really from the 8th century that the papacy could do something like calling the Franks uh, and, and, and being heard and, and and uh, um, and obeyed, and uh, this is why many people actually say that this is the same point at which uh, the papal states were were born in, in many ways. But uh, you know the the kind of the real problem is that um, at this point the, the Longbirds didn't really give back the the, um, the Byzantine territories to to the Pope. So there was a second expedition, so it, it was like a replica of the, s of the first one. Longbirds stopped the, the Carolingians uh, at, at the Susa Valley and they were defeated once again. The, um, this time Pippin's um, terms were quite harsher because uh, the Longbirds were forced to, to, to make very large concessions, both to the Pope and the Carolingians. And this uh, kind of, you know, weakened um, uh, irreversibly the Langobard, uh, the Langobard world. That up to that point, in spite of certain social problems, had remained substantially strong. Heistulf survived this second time as well, and before dying of a hunt in a hunt, uh, hunt accident, he was planning to to resist for a third time against the Franks. So it was a kind of uh, very stubborn 
a man and he truly believed and th that is fascinating because it also tells you how th these longbirds uh, already um, still at that time thought they could resist to the Franks which is a, is a it's an interesting um, hint uh, considering that we don't know much of those times we, d we don't actually know uh, anything about many aspects of the, 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 the powers uh, involved uh, we know yeah by sheer quantity probably we can do certain considerations but for instance we don't know much about the Longbird army of that time so we don't even know at that point after the second defeat what could the Longbirds hope to do in that situation but Isolf died now the the at this point Ratkis uh, uh, came out from his monastery and he was now completely a spiritual man he he became um, uh, king uh, once again so for the second time but uh, you know he was a very effective ruler at that point mm, not much because he was so much devoted to God that he made mm, laws mostly just to you know to 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 ask for social mm, peace and and, um, and 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 all but simply the longbirds at that point as uh, as a group uh, were understanding that uh, you know having been defeated so easily by the franks twice it now meant the long uh, that the franks could enter Italy whenever they wanted so there is a, a very big thing that we can understand from from the loaves of the Longobard kings of this time is that there were a lot of Longobards, um, of Italians, fleeing into the Frankish Empire at this point, and where loaves of Longobard kings will, will impose that the, the border guards had to stop people from fleeing, because there were a lot of people who were really fleeing with all their goods, with all their money, that that in order to to escape eventually would have become the the uh, the, the in, in Frankish invasion of Italy um so you you can't sense even from a lot of documents of that time a lot of historical news the incumbent catastrophes that the Longbirds were feeling to to arrive over their heads um eventually Ratkis also died and at this point um there was a new um um, uh, a new king, who is incidentally also the last Langobard king of Italy, uh, Desiderius. Now Desiderius was a faithful of uh, Eistulf, originally speaking. Uh, he was at that time a duke of Tuscany, um, uh, and um, he, he was Brescian by origin. And and that and and being a faithful of Heistulf, that tells you how much uh, actually Friulan aristocracy was was friendly with the Western one of Lombardy. That is supposed they were supposedly in antagonism. Completely false, historically speaking. Um, and Desiderius had been chosen exactly into this direction, but Desiderius kind of messed things up badly because at that point it is true that the the Franks were were about to um to um um yeah they the, the were about to invade Italy and that they however it was not really immediately um evident also because they were now the the, the uh, first of all Charles the Great had ri uh, risen to the uh to the throne together with his brother and they were clashes going on between the, the siblings uh the two siblings and uh, so they mm, the Franks couldn't intervene in Italy because of their civil war so the what Desiderius actually um did wrong was to um to um um to basically buy his own throne um now, from a Langobard perspective, this was a kind of uh, of an intolerable humiliation because basically he paid the Pope, uh, the Franks, to to be put on the Langobard throne. So this tells you, by the way, that the Franks, yeah, had an interest in Italy, but they could accept Langobards to go on for some time again. Um, 
and uh, if things had continued to go wrong in 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 the in 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 the in, in goal with the civil war, they might have not even gone to Italy for generations. Um, but the Longobards couldn't stand this, and this is. But we are at the very last years of the empire. We're in the 70s uh, of the uh, Longobard kingdom. We are in the 70s of the 8th century. Is that at this point the Friulan, uh, the northeastern um, Italian Longobards uh, nobility, kind of said, you know what, Desiderius, you made you didn't get elected by the uh, the assembly of the Longobard freemen like I it is our tradition as Longobards to happen. You bought your own throne from foreigners. From foreigners, and by the way, f ha have defeated it, uh, us in war. So who are you to be king? And at that point, there wasn't really an immediate um, rebellion or a Langobard, uh, or a civil war within Longobards. None of this happened. But the kind of northeastern Longobard nobility said, you know what, now we're on our own. So don't bother us. We live here, you live uh, in Lombardy, wherever you are. By the way, Desiderius was also doing things like putting goods in the, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in security by making um, dynastic, uh, mon by making, uh, having founded um, by his wife, um, um, uh, sort of dynastic monasteries that therefore became church property and couldn't be alienated even by the Franks where they would have invaded. Now this was telling a truth a brilliant move for uh, <laughs> for the personal uh, you know um, uh, future of Desiderius um, line, lineage, because obviously the Franks were about to invade, they would have Coat the Longobard Kingdom, but since they were protectors of the of the popes at that time, they could have not confiscated monasteries belonging to the formally to the church. And Desiderius wasn't even telling the truth. This very bad ruler, um, he he rose to power at the worst moment. He kind of was cunning and uh, scheming and uh, something like that, but. He was not stupid, and we we could even think that yeah he 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 made a bad mistake um but um there were too many variables at that time that had to be considered, and nobody knew what would happen in in a few years um and it's interesting at this point that Desiderius even gave his own um daughter. Um, is posed to Charles the Great. Charles the Great's first wife was a Longobard princess. By the way, the, the Franks uh, and Longobards had uh, a long story of intermarriage at uh, at a um, 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 at a royal level. Uh, there were also certain formal adoptions. For for instance, Lutebrand had been adopted by. Um, I don't know if by I don't remember by whom, but but by a Frankish king, I I, I would like to say something stupid, but it could be Charles Martel even yes, because the younger uh, you know the the, the young uh, Longobard noblemen were sent to the court of the of uh, of the Franks at a point and being having this right of having their hair cut by the king, which means that he adopted them, basically. This is something that the Germans used to do with between each other. And it's very meaningful to, uh, as a sign of friendship and of respect, because, telling the truth, we must say that the Franks uh, didn't respect anyone in Europe ex except the Longobards. I mean, the Longobards were the only people that the Franks recognized at a level of parity in Europe, I within the the same uh, all the Germans that existed there, which is quite meaningful because basically the Franks uh, were uh, Franks were recognizing to the Longobards a, a quite noble status in many ways. They they estimated them as German warriors, as um, as politicians, and 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 this is quite meaningful and tells you also so much about the actual success of the Longobards of the Langobard kingdom in many ways. Uh, when there was the, the Arab invasion of southern France, 
um, the, the, the Carolingians asked um, the Langbards uh, Lutbrand for, for military help, and Lutbrand even moved his, um, his army into Provence at the point. He didn't do anything because things changed suddenly, but, uh, you know, the Franks were, were, were kind of friendly to, Lang to the Langbards and kind of relied on them, and this is also part of the reason why um, they... Um, they they even exit exited a little bit um, and were quite progressive with the attack on the Longbirds because they didn't perceive themselves as enemies. And by the way, we, we are at a point in which the Carolingian Empire still to had to expand. So you have to always to think that before great expansions, there is always this. You can find this also in Roman history, on the Republic before the, the Punic Wars, etc. Um, or during the Punic Wars, the only threat, that there is always um, a kind of um, a reaction to expansion, there is always a rigid traditionalism that said that is overly concerned and prudent and says it's, it's not good, let's try to maintain our borders, let's not go out. Um, and these were things that were really felt at that time, and that partly even explain international um, foreign politics. However, it wasn't just all so uh, all those niceries. Um, for instance, there was a lot of, uh, of international playing, um, uh, sort of, can't say of proxy, uh, war because mm, that that wasn't really it, but the the Langobards and the Franks kind of played with this small um, political entity of the Bavarians that were technically a, a duchy emanated from the Franks uh, with a very st strange ethnical mm, connotation that actually seems to have been made up by a group of very different peoples, while the Franks and Langobards were kind of you know, ethnically mm, united, at least, uh, at, a, at a certain point. Um, and it kind of, mm, especially with marriages, but also with wars, they kind of tried to, to get it, you know? <laughs> the, the Franks and the Longbirds, either they were marrying or clashing with the Bavarians, trying to, to get them, the one from the other, so... But anyway, what happened is that... Um, Charles the Great was married even with uh, Desiderius' uh, daughter, but uh, eventually the civil war in Francia uh, came to an end beca simply because Carlomannus died. So Charles became sole king of um, of the Franks, which is the reason why we have a Carolingian Empire, by the way, because if things had continued like that. Uh, you know, we, we would have had the fragmentation of the Carolingian Empire one century before. So, as I was saying at the beginning of the video, it was quite a luck for the Carolingians, uh, for Charles the Great and for his son uh, Louis to, to survive all their brothers and to become sole monarchs. So, in 1771, uh, Charles, that was now King of Franks, broke the alliance with Desiderius and he invaded Italy. This time for <laughs> for good, or almost. Let's say that this is also interesting. He invaded Italy. Once again he tried the Longobards tried to block the Franks at uh at the Alpine passes. By the way the Carolingians obliged the Longobards to divide forces because they um, Charles invaded from one side. Uh, his uncle Bernard um, invaded from the St. Bernard Pass, in <laughs> ironically speaking. Uh, it's a case of homonym homonymy, there is no um, relation between the, the two names in the sense. Um, but Charles, according to tradition, was blocked by Desiderius at the um, foot of the Alps by the, the usual blockade. And tradition wants, but this see, might seem even, you know, a bit of of a literary topos in many ways. That uh, that resembles even the battle of um, uh, of the Thermopylae uh, with the Spartans and the Persians. That basically the Carolingians could not pass, and there was a, a Longobard betrayer who 
showed them um, a secret passage beyond um, between the the, the mountain uh, within uh, across the mountains and and basically the Carolingians made to took the Langobards from the flank and uh, and they kind of uh, you know vanished as as an army because they fled immediately. So at this point, um, Charles invaded uh, the Palm Valley, but it was a nine-month siege of the capital, the Longobard capital, Pavia. Now you don't find in any Carolingian um, campaign a siege that was so long. This for saying how um, the Longobard capital was um, uh, was a you know um, a force to be recognized to even for. Um, for the Carolingian army of Charles the Great, the one who invaded all Europe, um, so that basically Charles was obliged to just starve the Longobards, and after nine months of siege, even during winter, it was Italy, but you know even northern Italy is pretty cold in winter, um, uh, eventually fell. So that tells you even how you know resistant the situation was and how. Uh, politically united the Langobards, at least in Pavia, were, because they didn't surrender immediately. They, they kind of fought till the end. Um, and this with against the whole Carolingian logistics, that is, you know, oh, that was a formidable thing unseen uh, in the early Middle Ages um, in Europe. Um, so, um yeah, Desiderius basically went uh he also retired into um into monastery. Um I forgot to say that even this invasion of Charles uh, the Great was actually wanted by the Pope. Mm. But mm, this is pretty famous, so kinda was uh called once again into Italy. And and this time the, the Longobard Kingdom was uh conquered you know permanently and what is interesting about this um uh the um, eventually yeah he basically charles charles the great became king of the longbirds um this is very interesting because he didn't just destroy the longbirds and say yeah we destroyed longbirds woohoo no also here the, the franks were ca quite uh, respect towards the Longobards and Charles Great didn't wipe out the kingdom which which was by the way a brilliantly administered one with a very different mm, public um, uh, admi and highly functional administration that Franks did not have at all and they would never achieve basically not, not even mm, through all the efforts that Charles put into replicating it the 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 Longobard and Romanized uh, models, and he basically recognized the continuity of the Longobard kingdom. The Longobard laws remained uh, into Italy, even though you could at that point you could even acquire uh, as a freeman if you wanted um, a Frankish um, um, juridical um, identity if you wanted. Um, so. That was kind of uh, yeah. The Longobards were wiped out, but there are two things to add to this. The first one is the duchies, uh, especially the Duchy of Benevent, remained out of Frankish um, reach. Uh, technically, it was a vassal state, but in practically it was something really floating constantly between the Frankish Empire and Byzantine Empire and the. The Langobard rule in southern Italy would last until the Norman conquest, so it took other 400 years before before the Langobards proper were wiped out. And consider that Benevent was um, um, was seen as as a point of reference for all the, the Langobards of the north, who, after the Carolingian conquest, in in part, especially we're talking about, especially the cultural elites, kind of. Uh, took refuge into southern um, uh, Lombardy, let's say, <laughs> that was the Duchy of Benevent. Um, eventually, Duchy of Benevent even became a prince dom, so they kind of, the Duchy of Benevent kind of felt the legacy of the old uh, Longobard kingdom, so they kind of tried to acquire the same, even though they were a bit 
different for many ways in the sense that well now it's complicated but we'll talk about that um in the future let's say that this well yeah let's say that the the, the duchy of benevent was seemingly even pre-existing the Langobard kingdom itself because it seemingly was founded by Langobard auxiliary troops that the Byzantines had settled in s into southern Italy after the Greek Gothic War. So when, w when the big mm, mm, people of the Longobards eventually invaded northern Italy, these guys in Benevent rebelled and kind of formed their own Longobard duchy there. Um, they the, the difference with the Longobards of the north is that the Duchy of Benevent had a kind of, of a much stronger Roman influence, even in certain titles and uh, in offices. <coughs> Excuse me. And even after the um, and obviously, I'd say after the 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 fall of the Longobard Kingdom, at least the the Longobard dominated Longobard Kingdom of the North, they um, they they developed um, a form of um they kind of were exposed to byzantine influences so they kind of kept evolving i can't say towards that direction because they always remained longbird with longbird right etc longbird right survives through the duchy of benevent even into the norman um kingdom up to um contemporary history basically because the, the longbird laws uh, laws remained within the commune law of, of southern italy for an extremely long time the Duchy of Spoleto instead was kind of absorbed by the the, the Holy Roman Empire, let's say. <laughs> it wasn't called like that at that time, let's say the Frankish Empire. The Duchy of Spoleto remained uh, this entity that was telling truth, um, especially after the fall of the Exarchate and the, uh, and the arrival of the Franks, um, very strongly tied to Rome. Uh, and the Duchy of Spoleto that was eventually taken by the Franks um, was extremely close to Rome and the Dukes of Spoleto were, were quite important also in the following centuries because being close to Rome they kind of tried to become emperors in their turn uh, because all it took was to be crowned by the Pope in Rome at the point after um, it had happened with Charlemagne and the tradition had uh, eventually uh, been um, settled down um, by his su successors um, and uh, remained a bit of halfway so in fact usually when you see political maps of Europe um, of the Holy Roman Empire you notice that uh, even if there is the Papal States in the middle in the southeast there is the Duchy of Spoleto which technically is part of the Holy Roman Empire and, and it's not a Papal land. There is a, a second point though because people think that Charles Great invaded the Longbird Kingdom and said, oh, okay, finally we wiped out the Longbirds, we won't have to worry about anything. Telling the truth, um, things are not so simple because, um, and this is something about which we have a very scanty evidence, but it's still very relevant. Uh, we think that, uh, especially during one of the major Saxon uprising against the Carolingian um, uh, um, conquest of Saxony in the same years, the northeastern Langobards, those famous um, Friulan nobility that was so proud and, uh, um, and warlike in, in its uh, Langobard identitarianism, um, rebelled to Charles the Great. Uh, we actually don't even know whether Charles had ventured toward northeastern Italy when uh, Pavia fell. Probably he kind of had received a, mm, a sworn, an oath of allegiance by these people that obviously couldn't withstand at that moment the Frankish invasion and kind of had said, yeah, we accept the fact that um, you, have, uh, you have conquered this place. But the the uh, Friulan nobility, let's call it name it had, because it was the Austrasian, because 
um, or better known, the Austrasian was the Carolingian eastern part of the uh, Frankish territories. The, the Langobards had Austria, like the modern name of the ca of the country Austria, that has nothing to do with that telling the truth, even if the etymologies are similar because it means obviously the eastern part. So these Austrians uh, of northeastern Italy, because of all the problems they had had and distrust and contempt that they had had towards Desiderius, when Desiderius was defeated by Charles the Great, they didn't feel that um, they had been defeated too, because there was no battle, essentially, um, during the uh, Carolingian conquest of Italy. So in the north uh, in the Friulian um, um, point of view in the Friulian uh, perspective um, Charles uh, the Great and his Franks had defeated Desiderius they, they had not defeated the, the true Langobard people that they felt to embody um, as an ethnic group so what happened is that they rebelled actually to Frankish uh, rule at a point during one of these Saxon and, and Charles the Great was in a hurry at that point because Saxony was in revolt, Italy was in revolt so it was a kind of, uh, um, of a difficult situation this if, if I'm not wrong happened in 78, but I should check it out better and, and there is um, you know, the revolt of the Langobards is actually witnessed, historically speaking. Charles uh, invaded Italy uh, again and tried to crush this revolt. Now, we have only two sources about how things went. The first one tells that Charles obtained a big victory uh, and defeated the, these Langobard rebels and, however, granted them still certain privileges, like, for instance, remaining in place in their ducal uh, titles and kind of have a large autonomy which is really a great hint of a light hand compared to the iron fist that usually Charles used look at the Saxons so that already tells you that he couldn't be too harsh because he could make things worse there is a second source that is not Longbert, interestingly. So you cannot say this guy is pro Longbert, etc. And it is from a guy from Ravenna, incidentally. So uh, a formerly Byzantine uh, territory that had been conquered by the same Longbert. So he might have not had this huge sympathies for the Longberts, but we can't really say that. And he's usually a very reliable f source. Um, um, his name is Agnello from Ravenna. Agnello in Italian means lamb, essentially. That's a strange name. He was a uh, clergyman, so there were this kind of tender name of lamb. Um, and he was, uh, he's, uh, however, a very interesting source. I believe he's also one of the few sources about the Battle of, um, uh, of Fontenoy, the bloodiest... Mm, battle fought between the Carolingians um, during their civil wars and um, this lamb of Ravenna tells us that the Langobards on the river Livenza in northeastern Italy actually defeated the army of Charles the Great and he was basically um, obliged to make peace with these guys and to leave them you know rather autonomous because obviously they had um, if it is true it's obvious that they had achieved the impossible defeating the the Carolingian army at least the 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 most amazing military machine of Europe at that point after the Byzantines and this bunch of longbirds here in the northeast made it to kick their ass now it, it it's quite um interesting because um this source is was saying is usually reliable and there is no evident reason f for which this guy had to lie essentially and we have only these two options naturally uh even if the Longobards had defeated Charles Great in battle they they didn't have the strength from from northeastern Italy to to fight against the World Carolingian Empire so they also obviously kind of accepted submission in the end and uh, um, in exchange for a large degree of autonomy but it's still remarkable because it tells you how much these guys really believed in who they were and, and 
and and and kind of and they decided to stand their grounds in spite of all odds and they even made it or they didn't to to which source do you wanna do you wanna trust <laughs> We don't know. We will never know, probably, and unfortunately, but it, I think history is beautiful and extremely fascinating exactly like this, because it, it, it shows you at every time how much we do not know. And it's, yeah, I think in historical terms, it's more product. it's a paradox. It's more productive not to know things for sure than knowing them, because otherwise you would stop believing, you would stop wondering, you would stop trying to understand. So in this case we have this unsolvable dilemma that however m should make us probably reconsider the unity of the Longobard Kingdom that usually is painted like, you know, this kind of weak power, oh yeah, the Longobards divided, weak all completely false, all deriving. Do you know where does this stereotype comes from? It comes from the fact that historians judged um, the Longobard Kingdom at that point just um, on the base of the last years of Desiderius. That is a moment in which the Longobards had been u already defeated by a much greater force. Um, and therefore there was division in there, but that was not a normal situation with the Longobard Kingdom. It hadn't been up to that point, so you can't judge the Longobard Kingdom for seven years of, of reign or whatever it was <laughs> with a story that, that lasted essentially two se 200 years. And that shows instead a very strong kingdom in many ways. Sure, they, they hadn't the military of Charles the Great, of, of, the, of the Carolingians, but at this time nobody had the armies of the Carolingians. And, and the Longobards had kind of a very traditional army in, you know, relatively to German, uh, Romano-Germanic standards, so they weren't under the under expectations. And so there is, and, and, and by the way, the, the w I think the worst prejudice is that um, watching it at Desiderius' um, reign, uh, historians of an old, ge all older generations today, fortunately, the specialists don't believe this absolutely anymore. They thought that the the uh, the the, the Langobard kingdom was divided between this northeastern kind of traditionalist and warlike side and the more uh, economically developed and more kind of weakened. Um, uh, Western Lom Lombard and Tuscan block uh, uh, of the uh, of the west part of the kingdom where there was the capital, etc. Because it's completely false. First of all, not even during Desiderius there was a, a civil war between Longbirds. The kingdom remained exactly the way it was. Institutionally speaking, there was no change of any kind. There was no territorial collapse. There was no division of sort. At that time, the Longobard Kingdom was falling apart in those very years, just because the, the Franks were about to invade, and the situation was extremely messed up by the two previous invasions. So it, 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 wa it had nothing genetic uh, in it as a political body to in, in the way it, it has been previously thought. And let's say it clearly that uh, the Longobards were f f light years uh, far ahead mm, the, the, the Carolingians in the management of the public administration. There is no, absolutely no doubt about this. Um, Charles the Great tried everything he could to <laughs> centralize the, the, the Frankish world into a state, but they, they failed because they didn't have the uh, the centralized tradition and public authority that Longobards had managed to build up and however this was evidently not enough for the, the Longobards who were just this small uh, region essentially against a uh, half of a continent dominated by the Franks and how could they make it at that point. So I think that the battle of, on, of the Livenza River um, about which we have this very opposite um, um, doc documentation relatively to how it went could, telling the truth, show 
that the Longbirds, when united and, you know, um, determined and compact enough, even with a small fraction of the World Kingdom, like the Northeast, could defeat the most advanced army of that time. Which is amazing, it's brilliant, you know, it, it's a very romantic thing to think, and uh, I will come back on this, I, I might make a video uh, just on the Battle of the Livenza River, but in, in, in essence, basically, this is it. And this is how the Longbird Kingdom fell. So, sorry for the Longbirds. Um, but we will be talking ab about them uh, many times again. <laughs> I dedicated playlists exactly for this reason. Wow, this is the longest video ever, I believe. Um, I thank you for listening, if you have the courage to do that <laughs> at this point. If you like this video, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or, um, or, or share it. Uh, or no, I already tell you to share. Or otherwise subscribe, which is interesting because if you subscribe, essentially you get a notification that you can switch on or off as, as according as as you wish um, uh, every time I make a new content. So for now, uh, as always, I thank you very much for listening. Uh, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.